Amen. You may be seated. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Amen. Amen. He is worthy. Uh, and uh, one of the great uh, prophets uh, who would say that he is worthy is the prophet Isaiah. Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 3. Uh, Isaiah chapter 3, as uh, we are now in our second uh, sermon on this book of Isaiah, uh, I encourage you to memorize this book. <laughs> it is a hidden gem in the scriptures. Uh, it is an oil reservoir just waiting to be found and tapped into. Uh, it is noteworthy that Isaiah is, on one hand, obscure and unread by most Americans. But on the other hand, it gets quoted uh, at the strangest of times and by the uniquest of peoples. Uh, this week... Uh, in a very uh, famous funeral that took place by Elijah Cummings, uh, one of the House of Representatives who passed away. One of the speakers on the stage this week was former President Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton quoted the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. And then speaking about Elijah Cummings, he said he was a man like Isaiah who said, here am I, Lord, send me. Now, regardless of what you think of politics or Elijah Cummings or even Bill Clinton, the point is, is that, Eli, or that uh, Isaiah uh, is on the one hand very obscure and unread by many Americans, and yet it seems like culture at times cherry picks certain verses and puts them on display, as was done this week. Isaiah, talking the prophet now, uh, was not a politician but he had influence with politicians. He was not a philosopher, but he had influence with those who were intellectual elites. In fact, I heard it said regarding philosophers that a philosopher is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. <laughs> but Isaiah is not a politician. He's not a philosopher. He's a pastor. Uh, more specifically, he's a prophet who speaks on behalf of God. What Isaiah does is he shines the light of God's truth into the darkness of culture to point out the black cats of sin, diagnosing the problems of the culture, calling the culture to action, and then promising them one of two things. Either he promises blessing if we obey the Lord or curses and judgment if we disobey. This is Isaiah. As we journey through Isaiah, as we mentioned last week, we're not going through the book from chapter 1 through chapter 6 uh, uh, consecutively because Isaiah is more of a collection of his sermons, and so we are going to go through it thematically. Here's the eight themes that we're going to be going through. The eight themes of Isaiah, uh, we're going to deal, uh, starting today, with the problem of sin. Uh, six sermons dealing with the problem of sin. Uh, at Christmas time, we're going to be dealing with the arrival of Messiah after January, the hope of redemption. Throughout the Easter season, the life and death of Messiah. Uh, in the spring, the calling of believers. And near the summer, the promises of God, the judgment of enemies. And by next fall, uh, the coming kingdom. But all of these eight themes have at their very core this truth. Isaiah views everything through this lens of God's unfolding plan in history. The core passage was last week, Isaiah 46, where Isaiah says to the culture, remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. That is a promise of God. 
in Isaiah looks at the culture that, remember, 700 years or so before the birth of Jesus, he looks at the culture and at the very core of his confidence was this. There is one God, he is the true and living God, and every purpose of his will be fulfilled in both culture and history and in your life. So today we begin with this theme up on the uh, upper left, the problem of sin. Chapter three, uh, here it is, point number one. Uh, God disciplines those he loves. Will you say that with me? God disciplines those he loves. Take a look at this verse out of Proverbs. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, said, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof for the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Solomon affirms the discipline of the Lord. We're gonna get to Isaiah three in a moment. But the wisest man who ever lived affirmed that a loving God at times must exercise loving discipline. And there are times that we as his people need it. Now, this is very important. If you've already checked out of the sermon, really, you need to check in right now. This is important because not all hardship is the Lord's discipline. Are you listening? Okay, because chapter three is hardship that is specifically discipline of the Lord. So if you're facing hardship today, the very important question would be, is it actually discipline of the Lord or is it just a result of living in the fallen world? So just understand that Isaiah three is hardship that is specifically discipline from the Lord. Does this make sense? Okay, that's an important distinction. But the wisest man who ever lived said, don't despise God's discipline because the Lord disciplines those he loves. That's Isaiah 3. I arrived in Europe on this mission trip a couple weeks ago, and I got to our first hotel room after 20-some hours of travel. I opened my bag, uh, which I packed. It was not out of my possession. The TSA security, I told them the bag was never out of my possession. But somebody had slipped something in my bag. My son. I got his permission to share the letter that he wrote to me. Uh, he put a letter in there for his dad that I found in Europe. Here's what my son said to me in this letter. Hey, pops, I just want to let you know that you're the best. And I wanted to say that I love you and you're not only my dad, but my best friend. But the real reason I'm giving you this card is that I'm proud to be called your son and that will never change. You can be rough and tough but that's just training me for the future, and no one is better at that than you. Aw, isn't that nice? I wouldn't share that without his permission, but the key is that last phrase. You can be rough and tough. It's often been said in the Treeweiler uh, home, not just mine, but span it out, that the Treeweiler men are hardest on our sons. It's probably true. And we do it imperfectly. Uh, my dad was excellent, but he did it imperfectly. My brother does it excellent, but he does it imperfectly. I do it okay, but I'm imperfect. But listen, there is a God in heaven who when he is rough and tough, he is never imperfect and is always with love. And it's training us for the future. Isaiah 3. We enter into chapter 3, verse 1, witnessing discipline in progress. God's people are in rebellion. God has removed his blessing and the people, his people, are experiencing the discipline of the Lord. Isaiah has a very unique role. He has a national platform. Now picture this. He has a national platform to advise political leaders on the spiritual condition of the nation. He is more than a Senate chaplain. He is more than a spiritual advisor to the president. This man has a national audience with political leaders to address the spiritual condition of the nation, and he speaks to them with these words, thus says the Lord, and they listen to him. 
Isaiah goes into five ways that the Lord is bringing discipline. Take a look at it. He dismantles our resources, and we're going to make parallels, and we're going to tie this to our time. But listen, when God brings discipline, here's five ways or five things that he does. He dismantles our resources. Verse 1, for behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water. I want you to think and imagine how bad it must be, how rebellious the nation must be for God to cut the supply line of the most critical elements of life, bread and water. You know, one way that God can get our attention really quick is to dismantle or take away objects that we have grown to depend upon and lean upon as our source of strength. And one way that God can get our attention is is he cuts the supply line. Parents, I encourage you, maybe try this today. How many of you have teenagers? If they're ignoring you and you want their attention and they're not giving you their attention. This afternoon, go home and turn the router off. (laughs) Within 60 seconds of cutting off their supply line of the Wi-Fi, they will come running. True? But I want to ask this question. I wonder what router, what router, if God turns off in your life, will get your attention? We'll come back in a moment towards five very practical things that the Lord removes, and we've all probably experienced them, and it gets our attention pretty quick. But God also reduces our stability. Uh, Take a look. He not only takes away support and supply, bread and water. Take a look at this. He also takes away the mighty man, soldier, judge, prophet. Imagine these being removed from any culture. The diviner, the elder, the captain, the man of rank, the counselor, the skillful magician, the expert. And he says, and I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. What is God doing here? God is taking away their competent leaders. And in their place is a vacuum of leadership. In place of the qualified leaders of the culture, God puts in unqualified boys. He calls them infants in their place. Imagine the instability of a nation where your top political leaders in charge of the law, in charge of money, in charge of national security act like irresponsible teenagers. We can't imagine that. Third thing God does is he increases our desperation. Take a look at this. Increases our des- desperation. We can put that back up, it'd be great. It says, the people oppress one another. The youth will be insolent to the elder. For a man will take hold of his brother saying, you have a cloak, you be our leader. And that day, he, the brother, will speak out saying, I will not be a healer. You shall not make me leader of the people. There is a desperation here. A nation of desperate citizens. Anarchy prevails. A nation is entering collapse. Nobody's leading. The young show disrespect towards the old. Neighbors fight with each other. Uh, Raise of hands. I don't do this often. How many of you have a brother? Just raise your hand. Okay. How I do too. He might be watching. (laughs) How desperate would you have to be to say to your brother, please lead our nation. (laughs) Right? That's desperate. That's desperate. And imagine him saying, no way. I'm not joining those ranks. Single ladies, if you desire marriage, imagine, imagine a nation so depleted of good men that for every one man, there are seven women begging for him to marry them. 
Look at this, chapter four, verse one. Seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. Imagine seven men for every one woman saying, please marry me and I'll even provide my own groceries and my own clothes. It's every bachelor's dream. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I get to choose out of set. In reality, it's a nation in collapse. Here's what God also does. He opposes our rebellion. Take a look at these verses. He opposes our rebellion. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech, here it is. This is the why behind the discipline. Why is God doing this? Why is God allowing this? Here it is. For because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence, they proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. This is the root cause of why God is bringing discipline. The people of God defy the Lord. They are openly rebellious. And lo and behold, they think they're defying God, and then in reality, what they're doing is they're hurting, listen close, they're hurting themselves. About three weeks ago, New Hope had a, uh, a plumbing system problem on a Sunday out of all times. The whole plumbing system got clogged up. What we come to find out is that we think Somebody or some group of people thought it would be fun to sabotage the plumbing system by flushing an unusual amount of feminine products down the system. And they hurt you and they hurt themselves. And in like manner, here it is, Israel flaunted their disobedience and they sabotaged the law of God, not knowing that they're actually hurting themselves. The reality was they clogged, here it is, they clogged the blessings of God. And they're flushing their disobedience down. And, and, and all of a sudden, they find out that they're hurting themselves. They clog the blessings of God. Blessings no longer flow clearly between God and themselves. And it leads to the stench of the nation. They're, this is why God opposes their rebellion. And then it comes to this graphic picture. This is what God does as well. He removes beauty and strength. Take a look at these verses. As God imposes discipline on his people, it says this, in that day, the Lord will take away the finery, headbands, crescents, pendants, bracelets, scarves, headdresses, armlets, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, signet rings, nose rings, festal robes, mantles, cloaks, handbags, mirrors, linen garments, turbans, veils, Instead of perfume, there'll be rottenness. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. Those verses do not inspire a shopping trip to Saks Fifth. Right? Right? They're not life-changing verses. I've never heard any testimony of salvation that includes those ones. God is bringing a nation so low by removing their external beauty. For women, he removes their luxury items, the Gucci, their Armani, the Prada, the Vera Wang, the Tiffany's, the Chanel, the Dior, the Louis Vuitton, the Versace, all of it God removes, it's gone. And for the men, he removes their physical strength. And in the last two verses, they are defeated in total surrender of the nation. And take a look at the, how the chapter ends in verse 26. In verse 26, the whole chapter ends with the nation seated upon the ground in distress, weeping at the gates, Disaster has come. Isn't that, isn't that a powerful picture? Discipline started, and the whole picture comes to his people seated on the ground. Disaster. Let's get real practical with this. How does God do this today? 
How does God cut the supply line off? I bet he's done this in your life where he removes support and supply and he does it to get your attention because he's a loving God. Five ways he does this. First of all, financial hardship. Anybody ever had any? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Some of you are lying. (laughs) One of the ways real quick God gets your attention, isn't it? Financial hardship. He cuts the supply line. Car problems, don't you hate them? Unpaid bills, mounting pressures. And what is one of your instinctive responses when you go into financial crisis? You turn your eyes up, don't you? God, I need help. Another way he does it is through uh, friendship disloyalty, friendship loss. No raise of hands, how many of you have ever experienced that? Where the person that you have depended on for so long, all of a sudden, they turn their back. That employee that was once so faithful, gone. That family member that you learned to trust in. Disloyal. God gets our attention through those things. How about this one? Uh, Position or power loss. Have you ever been fired? Put on probation? Been overlooked for a promotion? Those difficult times in life where your career feels like a screeching halt? Makes you turn your eyes to the Lord. How about physical weakness? You begin to lose your health. The physical weakness of life. You realize you're not Superman anymore. A disease sets in. The diagnosis. And where do your eyes go? Turn to the Lord. And how about national and political disarray? This would be more on the national level. Listen, whenever God dismantles leadership of a nation, it leads to disarray and chaos in its people. This is what God does to get our attention. The good news is that God disciplines those that he loves. The wisest man on earth, Solomon, also quoted by the book of Hebrews, Hebrews says this, for the moment, all discipline seems, does anybody know? Painful, doesn't it? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later... Later, it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Not everybody grows from the discipline of the Lord, which is point two, leads us right in. Uh, God disciplines those he loves and gives a clear choice. These are the two verses, powerful verses right here. It gets real practical. Verse 10, tell the righteous it shall be well with them for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. But woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him for what his hands have dealt shall be done to him. This is the fork in the road, the real choice with real consequences. Isaiah says to the political leaders, here's your choice. If you obey, blessings will come from the Lord. If you disobey, the plumbing will remain clogged and you will have to deal with the stench of his removing his blessings. He says to tell the righteous, and this is a great verse, and it is a word of confidence and hope for all people, not just in Isaiah's day, but right here in northern Michigan. Tell the righteous, listen, folks, if you obey the Lord, if you seek him, if you submit your, your decisions to his counsel, if you seek him in prayer, if you do what's right, you can take it to the bank. Tell the righteous, it will be well with you. Are you listening? This is confidence. This is hope. This is the good news that God rewards you for what you have indeed done. It shall be well with you. 
tell the righteous, encourage one another, comfort one another, that no matter what you're facing, no, it doesn't mean that life will be without pain. It simply means that you will begin to experience the abundant life that Christ has offered to you. You will walk in his blessings. The, the plumbing, so to speak, will be free and clear, and you will be able to receive from the Lord the blessings that come from him, and you will be able to say, it is well. It is well. Tell the righteous, it will be well with you. Why don't you sing it with Pastor Rick? Rick, I've asked Rick to sing it. You guys know the song, When Peace Like a River. Sing it. When peace like a river attendeth my way. righteous, it will be well with them. That's one direction you can take, church. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but rather painful. But to those who've been trained by it, it yields the fruit of righteousness. Tell the righteous it will be well. Here's the other fork in the road. Isaiah says, woe to the wicked. It is a word of warning for all people. If, if you defy the Lord, if you refuse to obey, if you spend your life running away from him, he says, it will be ill with you. God would spare us that pain and he would spare his people that pain. Isaiah chapter three, here's the good news. It's a chapter of discipline, but it is, it is couched on one side by the people of the Lord, chapter two, ascending the mountain of the Lord. And on chapter four, it talks about the branch of the Lord Jesus Christ who will be magnified and glorified. Do you see chapter three, which is all discipline and hard news, has on both sides of it parenthetical hope. God would spare us the pain Tell the righteous it will be well with them. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with them. God would call us back if you're on the wrong road. C.S. Lewis, a former author, writes these words about being on the wrong path. He says this, if you have taken a wrong turn, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive. If you want to be progressive in your thinking, turn back to the right road. This is what the Lord would have. What does this look like in real life? How does God use discipline? And what does it look like to make good choices? Like right here, Northern Michigan. Here's a testimony of a New Hope man shared with his permission. He writes these words. By the age of 10, I knew I was going into the U.S. Army. This was my plan, A, B, C, D. This is the only plan. At age 16, I broke my arm playing high school football. Near the end of my senior year, I completed my Army paperwork, met with a recruiter, and was denied enlistment because of the metal plate and eight screws in my arm. I was devastated. I reluctantly enrolled at Northern Michigan University, not knowing that the God I didn't even know had other plans for me. I started to party hard and was majoring in bad decisions. 
Then I met a girl, now my wife, and had a choice to continue in my wild ways or grow up. I chose love. I quit drinking and slowly started to grow up. A friend invited me to church, and on April 4th, 96, I got saved. In retrospect, I see God's perfect plan for me now, even though I was disappointed with my failed plan. I thank God for my broken arm and how he transformed that into a life of messes to miracles. I am grateful to God for closing my door and opening his door because it changed my life. Yeah, good news. It's a great summary. This is God's unfolding plan, the broken arms in our life that on the one hand we view as a disappointment or life-altering or maybe discipline, hardship. But in retrospect, those things in our life that are hard at times are indeed discipline of the Lord and it leads us to make decisions to get on the right road. What I find awesome about his testimony is that all along the way, he faced choices. And these are real life choices between righteousness or wickedness. He faced choices when he was faced with wild ways or stopping the wild ways. He faced the choices of receiving the invitation to go to church or rejecting the invitation to go to church. When the pastor came to his house to explain the gospel of Jesus, he faced a choice whether to receive the good news or reject the good news. All along the way, our lives are paved with real life choices. And Isaiah would tell you, tell the righteous it will be well with you, but warn the wicked it will be ill with you. Point number three, Isaiah still speaks to our culture. God disciplines those he loves and presents a clear choice because all are accountable to him. Here it is, the great summary. We're not gonna go into this, but through Isaiah's perspective, there is one judge in the universe and we are not him. Here it is. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge his peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. The great perspective of Isaiah is that every single human being, the leadership, the princes, the rulers, the men, the women, everybody of culture of all time will stand before the judge of the universe to give an account. And on that day, nothing will be hidden from his sight. Isaiah believes that, do you? Yes. So what are we to do with this? How about some action steps? If you want, you could close your Bibles and really just tune in right now. What does God want you to do? Number one, vacation land, I would encourage you, ask God, ask God how he sees you, how he sees believers, how he sees his church. Don't be duped by luxury. Don't be deceived by wealth. There was a church in the scripture called Laodicea. They saw themselves as rich, prosperous, well-clothed. How did God see them? God saw the church of Laodicea as lukewarm, naked, blind, and poor, whose perspective counts. The Church of America, perhaps Northern Michigan, perhaps, sees itself as prosperous, rich, well off. I'm not convinced. I think beneath the fancy cars, the fat pensions, and the five-star Torch Lake homes, that God perhaps sees apathetic people who need a savior. Second action step, men, ladies, I'll get to you in a moment, please. <laughs> men, do what's right. In a nation devoid of godly men, do what's right. In business, do what's right. In finance, do what's right. Practically, do it. Isaiah presents two clear choices, and he would say to us men, men, tell the righteous men, it shall be well with you. Seek the Lord but warn the wicked. If you defy his glorious presence, it shall be ill with you. Men, do what's right. Practical action step for ladies. Women, reassess true beauty. Look at this quote. The world does not have a category for that beauty, but it is real, 
A God-filled woman is beautiful, whatever her age or her future features. Isaiah presents this picture uh, of the Lord removing from the women of the land all of their external adornment because he wants to expose the heart, and the heart is ugly. It kind of recaptures for us true beauty. True beauty is not a skinny waist, it's not expensive clothes, it's not fine jewelry. True beauty and the most beautiful women in the land are those who are filled with the Holy Spirit of God and who do what's right and who seek the Lord. That's true beauty. Take away all the external adornment, take away all of the the nice clothes and the fancy cars, but if, ladies, if you have a heart that is genuinely seeking the Lord, the Lord looks at that and says, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Americans, pray for our nation. Does this passage not call us to pray for the nation? Whenever God disciplines a nation, he dismantles the leadership, and he dismantles the leadership in order to turn the attention of its citizens back to himself. As we enter another political season over the course of the next year, one of the prayers that we ought to have is that God would wake up our nation give us godly leaders and raise up our nation, not to political triumph per se, but to raise up our nation in the sense of a spiritual awakening where our hearts turn attention to the Lord Jesus Christ once again. Pray for our nation. And New Hope, I'd encourage you to plead. Plead with Christ to be your savior. Look at these verses again in this passage we covered today out of Isaiah chapter three where a man takes hold of his brother, begging him, be our leader. Or women, seven women, who plead, beg with one man, saying, be my husband, take away my reproach. On one case, begging somebody to be your leader. On the other hand, begging someone to be your lover. I have good news. Better than a brother who leads and better than a man who marries is Jesus, who willingly takes away our reproach. He is the true and better leader who leads nations and peoples out of darkness into light. He is the true and better lover who takes away reproach and gives us forgiveness and opens up the channel of blessings between God and us to lead us into an abundant life. He is the true and better leader, the true and better lover, and he promises Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isaiah 3, God disciplines those he loves. And it leads to a clear choice, righteous or wickedness, because everyone is accountable to him. Does Isaiah still speak today? Say yes. yes. Amen, he does. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you today. For this book, a prophet which speaks to his culture and indeed speaks to the culture of all time. Lord, I pray right now in this moment that you would call us to action. Help men to do what's right. Help women to reassess true beauty. May we turn our attention back to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that even though we have the problem of sin presented here in the scripture, that we have the hope of a savior. Christ, our Lord, who is the true and better leader, he's the true and better lover, and we beg of you today to grant us salvation and forgiveness of sin. Thank you, Lord, for being faithful, and we give you praise.